Okay, so today I'm in Torquay with uh, Dave Phillips. Thanks very much for agreeing to talk to us today, Dave. Yeah, welcome, so, Simon. So, ex-chairman of Torquay United, yes. uh, a magistrate, yes. former racecourse trainer, pioneer and bookmaker, and one of the oldest still active. Have I missed anything? Uh, I think you probably covered it mainly, Simon. Yeah, whether I'm the oldest active, I probably doubt that, but I'm one of them, certainly. 75 years of age, so... Yeah, I, I mean, there's a, there's other firms that have been going longer than uh, than I have in 50 years, but um, probably the the descendants are acting now, not the actual original proprietor of the firm. Okay, so you, you you've been a bookmaker, like I say, 50 years, but one of your first experiences of a bookmaker wasn't a happy one. You got knocked by a firm called PTS. I had a count with them uh, for 750 quid after getting the jackpot up. What happened there? Well, the story in those days, I was um, very friendly with a, uh, another bookmaker called Matt Green. Trevor Green, it's real name, he, he trades under Matt Green. Um, we were quite keen punters in the uh, mid-60s, and um, we, we weren't bad. And uh, one of these days, it was at Ascot, at a jumps meeting in February. And we sat down on Torquay Seafront and went right through the card. And we did a perm, because this firm called PTS, Postal Turf Services of Epsom, the jackpot in those days was a five shilling stake. So we did it to, I think it was a shilling stake, 5p, whatever, did a perm. Um, we had a 33 to one winner involved in it. Uh, it was written by Richard Pittman, trained by Verley Buick. It's got, the old timers remember these names. And uh, anyway, it went right through. It came to the last race, and we we covered everything so far. And the last race was an odds-on favourite, and we left it out. <laughs> and we put a horse in called Rural Gamble. Never forget it. Driven by Stan Meller, and it won. So we copped it. And at that time, we were listening to the tannoy in one of Jack Bevan's betting shops in Torquay, and we were like, "We well, yes, got it." And it paid fifteen hundred pound for a shilling stake. So bearing in mind, this was in February 68. I was due to get married in three weeks after that, March 68. So 750 quid each to Matt Green and myself. It was, it was a lot of money. I mean, average wages in those days would have been less than 20 quid a week. You know, so 750 quid. Put honeymoon, paid for the wedding, the lot. Anyway, at that, at that time in our jobs, Trevor Green and myself were both working as telephonists at the the old GPO. Um, these days it's BT that run everything. In those days it was the GPO. And so we got a letter back from Postal Services with a, a form to fill out. Are you a member or do you work for the GPO? We thought, oh Christ, you know. We thought, yeah, we do, but it's got nothing. What, what's that got to do with anything? So we, the, the mistake we made, instead of lying and just saying no, we went to a solicitor and said, what do we do about this? And he didn't know anything about racing or betting or anything. And he went, you have to tell the truth. Yeah, so, so we put, yes, we are telephonists at the, uh, the GPO. Got a letter back within a few days. There's your stake back. Sorry, not paying. There's our rules. So it was like <laughs> despondency all around. But there you are. That, that was a, yeah, what can you say? Um, it was a, I wouldn't say a lesson learned. But yeah, I mean, terms and conditions. Probably it was in their terms and conditions. Any member of the post office were not eligible to bet with us. Yeah. Of course, all these days with them were, were postal turf services. It was sent through, you know, letter. And by the way, after that, when we were working at the GPO, we had the post office investigators come in, investigated us, and gave us a rigorous interviews to say we were, what are you up to? We don't believe anyone could do this, get this jackpot thing. So, yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah, we could do it. You know, we, we're absolute students of form. Well, I believe you put a 33 to one, but no one, well, it had a chance, you know, and um, we got cleared because we were, we were not guilty of anything. But, they, you know, it was, a, it was a lot of distrust at the time. Yeah, so you still got knocked. Still got knocked. So, but you eventually became a racehorse bookmaker. Mm. So when did that happen and how come you decided that was the game? Well... Matt Green and I decided that uh, we used to go racing a lot in the local tracks at Newton Abbott and uh, Exeter and um, sort of loved the, the colour, the excitement, just like the feel of it. So we thought we wouldn't mind having a go at this and um, spoke to a few people and always got sort of put off. No, no, it's not for you, not for you, da, da, da. But then we, we were quite keen. So um, we applied to the Devon and Cornwall BPA. It was a BPA in those days. It was Bookmakers Protection Association. It's no Bookmakers Associations. 
And uh, they said, OK, well, yeah, all right, you have to come for an interview. I think it was at the Grand Hotel or something in Torquay. And there was a big round table with about 12 on their committee and firing questions at us. And I think one of the questions that were asked, they said, what if somebody has a fiver at 13 to 8? How much are you going to pay them for that? I think it's £8, 12 and a half pence. No, I may be wrong on that. But I said, six to four and a bit more. <laughs> Didn't have really... Uh, but uh, anyway, um, Leslie Redfern, who was the uncle of Anthea Redfern, there was, Redferns were a monopoly in Torquay at the time, and there was uh, about five bookmaking brothers. And uh, he, he's the uncle of Anthea, as I say, and um, he said, well, how much capital are you starting with? And um, I think Matt Green and I had about 150 quid each, which seemed a lot of money at the time. I said, well, we've got 300 pounds. He said, do you realize that you can lose it in the first race? I said, oh God, no. <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, that's uh, they accept they accepted um, our application anyway, so that, that's where it's all started. Okay, because you had options at the time. D just uh, briefly, you were also a promising footballer and qualified as a football coach. Yeah, I mean, I was a good schoolboy footballer. I'd never really made the grade after that, but I was keen on um, coaching, and uh, I'd got an FA coaching badge and then attended a, a course at Lillishaw in Shropshire and got a coaching badge. Got to know a chap called Tony Waiters, who was an England goalkeeper at the time. And he and I said, uh, I, I wouldn't mind a future in this business. He said, yeah, he said, you're probably not being a professional. You wouldn't get a job here, but I can sort you out with a job in New Zealand as a sort of part-time player coach with a job. I said, yeah, sounds great, you know. And um, that was, you know, I fully intended to do that at one time. Hmm. So, so you decided to take the plunge as a bookie. But you and Trevor as a, a joint partnership to begin with we were we were called um, we were an amalgamation of our names and we were called dave green to start with yeah that was 19 november 1970. so you just had to uh, put your name down for pitches or put any money up uh didn't have to put money up in those days um you applied for pitches um some of them were easier to get usually the ones that are useless um uh, for instance, uh, uh, the, the, the Midlands, you could get a lot of pictures in the Midlands, uh, mainly in the Silver Rings. Well, you had to start in the Silver Ring. You couldn't start on, in Tattersalls or, or, or the rails. It had to be the, um, the cheaper rings you know, to, and do a 12-month probationary period, if you like. Right, so you were forced to do an apprenticeship as such in the old days. Yeah, right? which is fairly sensible. You know. So your first, uh, the first picture you actually got was in uh, at Leicester. Quite a yeah. long way from Torquay. Yeah, I mean, th this was sort of exciting times. We got this letter through. You, 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 you've been approved to bet at the Leicester Silver Ring um, from from now, you know. So the next meeting was in November 1970. So Trevor Green and I uh, fixed up accommodation, made sure we got all the right tools. Uh, I think we called it in Bristol on the way. A chap called Skylines used to do the... Um, some sort of equipment, an umbrella, I think we needed an umbrella, we, we, we had to buy that and we went up there and we turned up with all our gear, trooped into the course and the silver ring and um, I think all the Midland bookmakers just couldn't believe it, they said, where are you from? I said, from Devon, talking, I mean, are you serious? <laughs> this is like a Monday in November at Leicester, you can imagine, and uh, it was a two day meeting so we went to, went to both days. And after the, um, the three hundred pound capital, I think we went be, we went home with our tail between our legs with about two hundred quid. So that was a one and gone right away. <laughs> so how did you? Who learned to clerk then? Did you learn the job We got taught um, by a, a, a few uh, different people. I think one of them uh, was a chap called Roy Bicknell, uh, who Paul Bicknell is um, his um, nephew who used to work for me for quite a few years. Um, he knew the business, and another chap called Barney of Nuki, who worked for his, his brother, Les Fern, clerk for Harry Metcalf, the Jack Bevan firm, for many years. Yeah, they taught us the rudiments of clerking. Yeah. And of course, all the, all the figures in those days were down in shillings and pence. You know, there, there was no pounds mentioned, <laughs> never got that far. So, when did you, so you've done most of your tanking, when, when did you? Did you not think about turning it in there and then, or did you? Yeah, I mean, we struggled on. We struggled on um, from then. Uh, went to the Boxing Day meeting, didn't even win there. Um, the problem, one of the problems, I think we were more punters really, and uh, we, you know, we we fancied horses, and um, 
So that led actually, we never had a fallout, Matt Green and I, but um, we both had opinions and you know, one's gonna be right, one's gonna be wrong. One, one fancy the favorite, the other one doesn't. So on the way home, somebody's gonna be right, somebody's gonna be wrong. So he decided to go on his own on his own back. But, but before then we attended Newton Abbott on Easter Monday, 1971. And it was in the middle of the course there now, which they don't bet there now. And uh, I think the stakes were, minimum stakes were four shillings, 20p filled up the columns it was like massive and at the end of the day we looked at one every race and we netted after expenses 155 pound which average wages then were 20 quid a week so i thought wow this is the game <laughs> that sort of changed my outlook about you know football and things and i thought i think we'll concentrate on the bookmaking side of things okay so back in those days when you applied for a pitch you had to qualify to actually get it how did that work yeah you had to do um i th oh, let me think now it's coming back a bit um but um, you had to do i think it was 75 percent of all meetings i mean some of them were desperate but um and there's a number of bookmakers who actually didn't qualify they, they were called casuals and they uh, and of course if anyone come in after them and did qualify they'd jump over them so it was quite important in the early days to to qualify if you could and uh, that's what you know. That's what I intended to do. Okay, so you, so you started your life as a racecourse bookmaker, as a just on the list sort of, you know, bookmaker. Mm. You're looking for clashes, and uh, Yom Kippur was always a big day. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I'm not sure what time of year it is. Um, my Jewish friends would probably tell me, but when Yom Kippur occurred, <laughs> serious Jewish people it was a very it was a religious holiday, and the front, virtually the front lines of the London, London tracks were empty, <laughs> so everyone got a move up, and uh, yeah, you wouldn't miss those days. You ended up with a very good pitch instead of a, a bad one. And you said that you, you, you and Trevor were both opinionated. So, mm. did you have to be a good judge and an opinionated bookmaker to survive in those pitches in those days, or could you make books as such? Uh, no, I, th I think in the bad pitches, it was impossible to make books. You had to have some sort of sway and an opinion, and um, yeah, we, we, you know, I was a pretty keen form student, so uh, I had lopsided books. I mean, uh, but that's the way it was, you know. In bad pitches, it was impossible. Okay, now who would have been the the kingpin bookies back in the day when you started? You would have looked up to or been in awe of. Well, I mean, um, I mean, bearing in mind the silver ring, there wasn't any any kingpins when you went into the main rings. Um, as it happened, the Stephen Little. Uh, started virtually probably about three or four months after me because I know I was always just in front of him on the list and um, he used to turn up well he's quite well um, established in it, that uh, he used to turn up on his bike and with his big fur coat and um, he, he it was quite strange because he used to be quite a, what they call a fiddler really and all of a sudden it seemed to turn into his taking 10 grand bets you know but he, he was um, obviously the king of the ring. I mean, he was allegedly the biggest bookmaker in the world. Uh, a bit tricky betting next to him, although he never, he never, um, he never pulled the odds too much. You know what I mean? He was quite fair, and um, but big punters knew they could get on. And, and talk, uh, talking of big punters, who would have been any names you can pull out the hat for back in those days? Not really. They didn't. They just certainly didn't come to me. <laughs> uh, they would have gone to Little, but a, a lot of the. Uh, Little's clients were, I mean, it was uh, it's supposed to have been Manus and Table and all that. I mean, I don't know. And, and Stephen never disclosed any secrets like that. So I wouldn't know. But um, uh, I mean, we had the regular uh, punters like Eddie the Shoe, who's still around now, obviously, and um, Dodger McCartney, who uh, was always a jolly sort of chap. And um, yeah, I mean, th 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 there, were, there was a few characters around. Who used to, Johnny Lights used to in the London tracks seem to get some good information from somewhere along the lines 